So, good morning, everyone. To all the panel members, to all the viewers who are watching us, to all the senior officers of Andhra Pradesh Forest Department, to the officers and the team members from Central Zoo Authority. So today we welcome you all to this session, inaugural session of the program, Bharat Ka Amrit Mahotsav. We are in a week where we are celebrating the species Asiatic wild dog, which is called Dhol also. So locally popularly known as uh, Dhol. Basically, to give you a brief introduction about the program which is going on, uh, this is basically a program called Conservation to Coexistence. It's a People's Connect outreach activities we are carrying out in this program. And as a part of Bharat Ka Amrit Mahotsa, where we are celebrating 75 years of Indian independence. Uh, and this program already started and it's been many weeks now. And it will be culminated uh, on 15th August, where we'll be completing 75 years of Indian independence. And during these 75 weeks, we'll be ending up with celebration of 75 species of wildlife uh, and various in situ and ex situ uh, programs, conservation activities uh, of these species, which has taken place across the country. And may, uh, each zoo has been given one, uh, one species. And uh, we are thankful to Central Zoo Authority that we have been given this opportunity to uh, carry out this week long uh, program, outreach activities, and celebrate this amazing species uh, called Asiatic Wild Dog, which is an endangered species and also that we have been carrying a successfully conservation breeding program for the species and we have a very good population. So it's our privilege and also a great opportunity for us to showcase our activities. Uh, so I welcome you all on behalf of Indira Gandhi Zoological Park with Shakha Patnam. I'm Nandini Salaria, curator of uh, Vizag Zoo, popularly known as Vizag Zoo, IGZP. And uh, also on behalf of Andhra Pradesh Forest Department and Central Zoo Authority, I welcome you all. So we hope that uh, we will be able to provide you much information about this species and you will be really amazed to uh, know about this species. So today we are uh, starting with the inaugural session and we welcome everyone around. And uh, firstly, I would uh, we have uh, with us uh, expert members from Wildlife Institute of India. We have senior officers from Andhra Pradesh Forest Department. We have our conservator of forest, uh, Vishakha Patnam, uh, Shri P. Ram Mohan Rao, sir. He's an IFS officer. And uh, we also have many other officers from Central Zoo Authority logged in with, the, uh, with us in this session. So with this, I would now like to uh, uh, invite Dr., um, uh, Shri P. Ram Mohan Rao, sir, our conservator of forest, Vishakha Patnam, to give the inaugural remarks for this session. Thank you, Nandini. Good morning to all the wildlife lovers today watching this webinar. Indira Gandhi Geological Park has initially started this conservation breeding of wild dogs during the year 1991 with a pair of two females and one male. Since then, we are breeding the wild dogs in captive, captivity very successfully and the number is increased to 39 now, 39. So it is a great success because of this uh, environmental uh, existence, the natural forest is there looking like that because of that uh, congenial, congenial for this thing, the wildlife breeding. Yeah. So we could achieve these uh, 39 numbers. Now we want to, uh, what is that? Uh, we acquire, we will, we will bring some new animals, wild dogs from other zoos, and we introduce new blood into our population. We also exchange some wild dogs to other zoos also during animal exchange program. But we need uh, some financial support. We are trying for uh, so many sources. We are requesting CJTA and also under CSR, we are approaching so many industries in Usha Patan district. But we are unable to get it, but uh, soon we will get it. This uh, one week program started from today to 20th June. 
you have called so many eminent speakers right from uh, indian institute of science education and research tirupati and wildlife institute of dehradun and uh, salim ali center for ornithology and natural history coimbatore so we thank all the speakers to give their for giving their lectures during this program on this program today i welcome speakers of this occasion dr bila lavi scientist he head of animal ecology and conservation biology wildlife institute of india and dr kamesh scientist he department of landscape level planning and management wildlife india wildlife institute of india so i express my thanks to our beloved and pradeep kumar garu pcf of and chief wildlife warden and sri rahul pandey cc of wildlife for their valuable support and guidance in organizing this webinar i also express my sincere thanks to madam sonali ghosh deputy inspector general of rs cjd government of india for initiating this 75 week long program to create awareness among the people covering 75 species all over india we are confined to wild lux during this week we have been conducting this week which program is there and accelerating uh, competitions are there and through webinar we, we are calling so many experts and they will be educating our people regarding wild ducks so with this i thank one and all thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, so sir has already given a brief uh, i mean outline of what the conservation of uh, conservation breeding of wild dogs is going on in igzp i would like to talk about it probably uh, in a bit detail in the end of this session so now i would like to welcome uh, dr bilal habib uh, he is a head of animal ecology uh, division from animal ecology and conservation biology from wildlife institute of india dehradun he is scientist e and head of this uh, division he has been involved in uh, field research since uh, year 2001 and has worked on various species involving wolves in semi arid and uh, trans himalayan uh, landscapes he has uh, worked on leopards from the himalayas to central india he has also worked uh, on dholes from low intense uh, low density to high density areas which is the species of uh, today's top uh, session and he has also worked on marco polo sheep and snow leopard in the afghan afghan pamirs to also understanding movement of large carnivores in a human uh, do dominated landscape in response to anthropocene his research interest includes mainly integrating science based solutions to developmental activities especially the linear in infrastructure and he has been as per my knowledge involved in lot of uh, such projects in the state of maharashtra and other states as well in india so i am hoping that we will be having a great session with dr B uh, bilal habib and i personally has been his student while i was in i wildlife institute of india and certainly i am hoping for a great session uh, now so over to you dr bilal habib good morning madam thank you uh, thank you so much for your kind words uh, so i will be sharing my screen uh, so that So yeah, I hope uh, it's visible now. Yes, yes, it's visible. Yes, yes, it's visible. Yeah. So uh, I will be talking about uh, about wild dogs as when when I was asked to give a title to this particular talk. So I thought, what should be the most uh, the most encouraging title or the or, the, or which actually depicts the species? So I thought about it. Say it's a mysterious uh, predator of Indian jungles. Uh, there has been a lot of stories about dolls, and uh, dolls have been there with us uh, from a very long time. And still, if you say in terms of research, a lot has been done on so many species, but uh, 
the dole has not got that particular attention which it should have been so so like if you go back to the historic records like uh, e g adams uh, there's a there, uh, he was a nationalist with nilgiri game association so at the time people there were a lot of misconceptions about dole like one of the misconception was uh, they are uh, they are very uh, notorious sort of predators uh they can uh, they can kill even 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 tigers uh, they can make tigers to run for their life out of that particular place and these were not taken as a as a good predators in indian forest so there was a lot of a uh, lot of different sort of uh, myths associated with the, with uh, with jewels and these these continue to be there even till uh, even today so a lot of misconceptions like uh, uh people not feel good with the dolls people have a lot of stories about dolls like if, if the dolls they start chase you in a forest what is going to happen what's going to how you are going to save your life so a lot of such uh, stories are still with the dolls but yes uh, uh there there are a lot of things uh, which probably we don't know so if you say in terms of its status it has got a same status as that of tigers it's a, it's a, it's an endangered species uh, like tigers elephants and other big uh, fauna in our country and we everybody knows that we have almost uh, 3000 tigers in our country right now but if you ask somebody what's the population of the dolls probably we don't have the scientific estimate for doll population in our country even today we don't know how many dolls we have but there's a there's a sort of uh, we call it as a guesstimate that there, there are something around 1000 to 200 2200 a uh, mature uh, wild pears uh, in this uh, in this part of the world and uh, their distribution is indian subcontinent uh, and southeast asia it's a monotypic species which is a very very interesting it's a single genus uh, species like it's a genus uh, the kyon genus has only one species so that makes it very interesting in terms of when you talk about the evolutionary aspects of the species or if you if you try to try to think about the genetics of this particular species so it makes it very interesting so now now just just think about that it's a species which is endangered like tigers leopards elephants and uh, the population is less than that of uh, the tigers in india and in terms of its disturbance resistance so it's not a species which loves with disturbed forest so it's mostly present in forests which are very less disturbed so the distribution is far less than the distribution of tigers in our country and then uh, we have a captive population there are a lot of zoos uh, in india where there is a captive population of dolls but this population is in uh, is highly interbred so like if if we if there is some issue with the dolls in the wild and we are thinking of taking a dolls from the zoos and reintroduce it to the wild we really have to think about this particular aspect right now because right now we can just try to breed the dolls of the one zoo with the other zoo to restore that uh that that interpreting issues but as on today uh, there's a lot of uh, the the population in zoos is highly interbred so it's an endangered and and in india uh, we have almost lost the 80% distribution so this is this is the overall distribution uh, uh map of the dolls and uh, uh if you if you consider this distribution with the distribution of the dolls 100 years back so we have almost lost around 80% of the distribution of the dolls in our country so with this uh, like uh, and and the and the doll again if you if you see this doll uh, in indian context it has to share its habitat it has to share its landscape with many other large predators in indian jungles so the dolls in our country they share the land with with the tigers they share with the leopards and they share with the sloth bears so it's not only that uh, dolls have to just survive of their own in indian jungles but at the same time they have to coexist with other large predators which are there in indian jungles so the smaller in number uh, they are they are very very uh, uh, very uh, prone to disturbance so they have to always be in a forests which are not disturbed so as we all know that uh, all forests which are not disturbed have a very good population of uh, tigers leopards sloth bears and other bears uh, within the distribution uh, range of dolls in india so a lot of a lot of things about the dolls to think about and and to think about how they are going to survive uh, in indian jungles considering all these particular aspects uh, which a species is facing 
and in indian jungles we 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 really see such type of events when those are really chased by the large predators uh, that's Something is wrong, probably. Uh, we'll uh, just... Yeah, yeah, joining back. There was something, some issue. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so these doles in in Indian jungles. Uh, so they also have to share their uh, their habitat. So they have to share their life with large predators, <laughs> and, and which makes uh, which makes their all together their their ecology a very interesting aspect. Smaller in size, stronger in the number of individuals, which we call as a pack size a species, a, a species which is uh, which doesn't like more disturbance, and then at the same time sharing its habitat with the large predators. So understanding the ecology of the doles uh, in such uh, in such scenarios is really interesting, and there has been a couple of studies in the past, and there are a couple of studies going out right now, which uh, which we try to understand that how this species actually uh, performs or actually like sus actually is sustained in these isolated forest patches uh, in our in our country. So now, now talk about the diet of this particular species because that's the first thing where there's a lot of overlap with other species, uh, especially with the tigers and with the leopards uh, in Indian forests. So we have done a global review about the dole diet uh, across, uh, across I think five or six countries and across 16 sites uh, across the dole distribution range and uh, taking into account around 8,000 scats and around 600 kills. Uh, and we have found that uh, they have a huge variety of the prey which they take. So around uh, 35 species of the prey, which doles actually take. And, uh, and, and if, you, if you see that, uh, the sambar is the topmost. So, so that, that, that probably indicates that the dole habitat totally overlaps with the tiger habitat. Because if you, if you see, see the wisdom of our uh, old scientists like Dr. John Singh was always saying that the sambar conservation is tiger conservation. And if you see the dole diet, it's also the most preferred prey, the most representative prey uh, in dole diet is a sambar all across its distribution range, which indicates that if, if uh, there's, a, there's a total overlap between the diet of the tiger and the diet of the dole, so which, which brings the two species in direct interaction with each other. And if you see the preference, uh, yes, definitely the smaller species uh, like the hares, they, they are the preferred prey, prey of the doles, but the sambar, mouse deer, gural, and the cheetah, they form in this particular order as the most preferred prey of the species. So a lot of people are interested uh, in talking about the conflict with this particular species, especially in terms of the livestock deaths by the doles. And that's very low because as we know that, uh, Doles are not present in human-dominated landscapes. 90% of the time is the avoid human-dominated landscapes. So the possibility of dole preying on livestock or, uh, or any other domestic prey is very less. And this particular analysis has indicated that, that the dependence on domestic prey is very low. So which is, which is very good sign when we talk about the uh, uh, conservation of the doles in India. So we don't have to think about uh, the conflict with the humans in that particular, in, in, in a great extent. But we have to think about its survival, its coexistence uh, with other predators, which is one of the key factors in determining the survival of doles in Indian jungles. So talking about, uh, so the, one of the most interesting questions is like, if you, if you, if you try to understand 
the distribution of the doors in India. And then you try to understand the pack size variation in doors. So if you go Northeast India, you can see a very small pack sizes around around four to five individuals together in Northeast India. If you go to Southern India, the forests of South India, you can see around 18, 20 doors together as a pack. If you go to the Central India, you will see around eight to 10 individuals as a, as a, as a, as a pack members. So we're interesting in, is there any difference in play choice, play selectivity, and the pack size. Do the bigger pack size, pack size prefer a larger prey species? And the smaller pack sizes like the packs in the Northeast India, four to five individuals, or the packs in the Central India, which are around uh, eight to 10 individuals, they prefer smaller. But very interestingly, no. So the pack size is not related to the prey size which they eat. In fact, they need a minimum five doles to hunt the largest prey. So even if they have to kill the largest prey, which is a sambar, so those don't need to be in a larger group. So that minimum functional prey size, which is required to even hunt the largest animal which they eat is around five individuals. So the, so the most optimal prey size for the doles is around five individuals in a pack. So that means the, the dole packs in Northeast India they're not smaller in size. They are the most optimum dual pack sizes which we have in our in our country. And if you see the uh, the, the overlap in diet uh, with, with tigers and doles, so we have divided this into weight class. So if you see, uh, they prefer the doles. The most preferred uh, prey range for the doles is around 30 to 200 kg, and this totally overlaps with the leopards, which is around 30 to 200 kg. And it again uh, overlaps with the uh, tigers, but tiger has a more a wide range, which goes from around 14 kg to our uh, to almost over 200 kg. So in terms of diet, there's a totally total overlap between uh, doles, tigers, and leopards. So when we are thinking about the conservation of doles in Indian forests, when we are talking about the dole reintroductions, when we talk about the dole management. The most important aspect which we think about is their diet overlap with other large predators which occur in Indian forests. So this is one of the most critical information which we have to know about the doles when we talk about the dole conservation in Indian forests. So the second most uh, uh, important aspect is to know about uh, how doles move. Now we have seen that they share their habitat with the tigers, with the leopards, with the sloth bears. They don't like disturbed areas. They are in forests which are not disturbed, right? And these undisturbed forests are the prime forests in our country, where we have tigers, where we have leopards, and where we have sloth bears, the other large predators. So under these circumstances, how doles do space? So we have talked about the diet. Now we'll be talking about the space, how they share their home race with other large predators like tigers, and doles in human dominated landscapes. So in order to do this, uh, we have so far colored uh, five doles in high density area, which is Thado Bandiri Tiger Reserve. So this year we are planning to color some doles in a low density area, which is uh, Navigaon Nagzara Tiger Reserve. So we're trying to compare how doles like behave in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a higher tiger density areas, higher leopard density areas, and how doles are going to behave in a low tiger density areas, but higher, uh, leopard density areas. So uh, uh, to call a doles, you need a professionals uh, to call a doles because it's one of the most difficult tasks. And we have one of the most amazing person in the team, Dr. Paragnigam, and he's the most professional veteran, veterinarian, wildlife scientist in Wildlife Institute of India, the most professional person to deal with this particular aspect. And this was the first time that we were trying to call a free ranging doles and trying to call them with the satellite callers. So once coloring is done, so we have an information about dole home range. And yes, the almost the dole home range, they go as big as uh, 76 square kilometers. And these are the different individuals, our five individuals, which we colored in Taroban Lady Tiger Reserve. They belong to uh, three different packs. So, so average core area is around 20 square kilometers, where is the, uh, where is the average larger home range, which is around 100% MCP is around 70 uh, square kilometers in this particular uh, protected area. So when we talk about uh, 
when we talk about their movement, so they, they are very interesting species. So they have to, in terms of the diet, they're totally overlapping with the tigers and leopards. So there is no isolation in terms of avoiding what they eat. So they have to eat the same things what tigers and leopards are eating. So in order to survive, so that so that if you see the so the, the theories of coexistence, the theories of the coexistence, they talk about that the animals, they have to isolate either on one axis or the other. There are multiple axes when, when an animals live in a human or when an animals live together. So if the, if the two animals have same diet, probably they have to have a different habitats. Now, if they have to, if they have to occur in the same habitat and they have a same diet, then they have to isolate themselves in the, in the temporal axis. That means they have to be on a different time scale. So now we were trying to think about how those are behaving when they are in the when they are in the landscape where there are tigers and where there are leopards, and and they have a different pattern. So in in some part of the year they are territorial. That means they try to protect their territories, uh, which 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 is uh, which are around 70 square or 80 square kilometer of the area, and they defend it like the tigers defend their territories. But in some part of their year when they are denning. They, they really defend a very small part of their area, which is almost 20% of their total home range. But as soon as uh, they go from a non-denning period, denning period to a non-denning period, when the pups actually leave den, they have altogether a different strategy. So during a one year period of the time, those don't behave like they are territorial all, all year around. So they have a different strategies for different parts of the year. And the, these strategies are governed by what they have, what they are carrying. So if they have, they have a very young pups with them for some part of the year, they will definitely behave in a very different way to avoid being predated, being killed by the other large predators like tigers and leopards. Because when they have a young ones, they're very vulnerable to predatory events by the large predators which they share with. So, uh, so the uh, so the our callers are also equipped with activity sensors. So we are also trying to understand uh, what's the activity of the doles uh, in 24-hour cycle. So if you see this particular axis, so this is the day of the time, and this is the different days. This is almost a one-year data set. So if you see this particular graph, you will see that the darker, the more activity is. So doles are very active during uh, during early morning and late evening hours. But uh, they are they, are, they take a rest during middle of the day. So so the so the activities are almost similar to that of the other large predators, uh, which is tigers and leopards in the landscape. But when they are denning period, when they are denning, their activities totally change. So during denning time, they have to be very active because they have to protect. They have to actively uh, patrol their areas. They have to protect their area, and that's at the same time, they also have to protect their uh, young ones, which are very vulnerable to predation by other predators. And then in the post denning period, they, they actually go to the normal phase of a pre denning phase. So, so, so this again, the activity sensors and the movement pattern reflects that doles have a different pattern of using across their uh, distribution in different seasons of a year. So they are, they are, they are very, very smart predators. They, they actually know how to behave during different parts of the year, when they have young ones with them, when they don't have the young ones with them, when the young ones are really bigger in size, when they join the normal pack activities. They, they, active, uh, they actually track their, their life cycle with this. So this is the same thing uh, 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 just put with some photographs. So this is a pre denning period when, uh, when, they, they are, when they are adults, when even, even if they are the young ones with them, the young ones are at least eight to nine months. Uh, they are in the phase of the dispersal, they play, but then they go denning phase when they give birth to the young ones. And during this particular phase, they den. Uh, they actually participate in the denning activities, both the male and the female. They have helpers. And the post denning is when these small young ones are now actually walking the adults uh, in, in these jungles. So this is when the young ones actually travel with the animals all across uh, the Indian forests. So they actually track, they actually see how they are going from one particular place in that particular forest to other particular forest. And this particular behavior, this, this the way 
they exploit uh, the areas where we have tigers, where we have leopards. So is one of the fundamental stones, is one of the cornerstone for their coexistence with large predators uh, in Indian forests. So, so this, this is one of the very, very, very interesting aspect of their ecology uh, to, to sustain in Indian forests. So luckily, uh, like we were working in Tadoba, and when we had a dual trying to see how tigers behave and how tigers behave and we got a very interesting uh, uh, aspects from this particular study so if you see this particular map so you have this particular code this particular black area is area used by the tigers and the pink and the blue ones uh, green ones are the dole home ranges and if you try to understand this particular aspect you say that the the core area of tigers is totally avoided by doors there's a very less overlap between a doll core area and the tiger core area. So there is a total isolation, total separation when we talk about the utilization of the core area by dolls is Indian jungles. So for, for, uh, for pack one, there was just 1.3% overlap between the core area of a doll and the core area of uh, the tigers. And, and with the other pack, it was almost 0%. So they don't overlap in core areas. But if you go to the buffer areas of the home range, buffer area like uh, more than 30% more than of the home range of the dual and more than 30% of the home range of the tigers, that's why they overlap. So the buffer areas for the dolls uh, with the two different packs of the collar tigers and with the dolls, the overlap is around 21% and 44%. So this again is one of the very interesting ecological aspects. So the core areas where there are core habitats of the tigers, so those try to avoid them. Whereas in areas which are used by the tigers, but the use of uh, intensity of the use is not so high. So dolls, the intensity of the use of the dolls is higher there. So that's how actually they survive, how actually they they coexist with the large predators in. In, in our in our forests, so that was that was one of the very important understanding for our uh, telemetry studies. So we also tried uh, to understand the dole pack size variations. Like when I was talking about the diet, I told you that dole has a large dole has a variation in pack size. If you go to northeast India, the pack size is around four to five individuals. You go to the south India, the pack size is around 18, 20 individuals. You you will really see very large size dole packs in South India. But if you go to the central India, the dole pack size are very small. You can see them around, around eight to 10 individuals in, in, South, in, in central Indian forests. So we were interested in what are the factors which govern this pack size? It, is it the strength in numbers? Or is it that there is the, the larger prey and these animals have to kill large prey species? Or there is something else which governs dole pack size in, in, in India, in different parts of the India? and across the distribution range of the doles in Southeast Asia. So in order to do this, we first did select two sites. So one was the Navigama Nagzara Tiger Reserve and other was the Thadobandedi Tiger Reserve. And these two, and we have a very, very, very strong variation, very different variation in terms of the dole pack sizes in, in these two protected areas. Uh, in Navigama Nagzara Tiger Reserve, the doles, the average pack size of doles was around 15 individuals. Whereas in, in Tharoba, the average pack size was around five to seven individuals. So there was a huge variation in dole pack sizes. So we were trying to understand what, what are the mechanisms, what's the reason behind such a huge variation. And when these tiger reserves are in a similar type of habit, habitat, they're just 50 to 60 kilometers apart from each other. And uh, in terms of the prey density and the prey composition in these two particular site is almost similar. So this is the data about the prey, uh, prey density uh, in these two particular areas. So the prey density is almost uh, same in these particular areas. And, uh, and the only thing which was variable in these two tiger reserves is, was the tiger density. So the tiger density of the, ti uh, of the Tharoba Andheri tiger reserve was around six individuals per 100 square kilometer. And it was half an individual per 100 square kilometer. So there's a huge variation. There was a five times variation in tiger density in these two protected areas. In terms of prey composition, in terms of the prey density, these tiger reserves, they didn't differ. 
and there was a 2.6 times variation in door pack size in these two protected areas. So, so, so the site level characteristics. So when we are when we are comparing two protected areas, so tiger density was one of the most important factor in determining the pack size in a similar type of habitats. So we were interested uh, in taking this exercise beyond uh, two protected areas. So we were now interested in knowing this in a much larger landscape uh, across the dual distribution range. And the pattern was very similar. So the prey density or the type of the prey species are not determining the dual pack size. So in respect to whatever prey species are, they are not determining the prey pack size of the dolls. So it's actually the tiger density which determines the dole pack size. So now, uh, probably in future, we may talk about dole reintroductions. We may talk about uh, the taking the doles from Indian zoos uh, to the wilderness areas. So this is one of the most important piece of the information which we have to consider. So if we have a higher tiger areas, how doles are going to behave in those particular areas. And if we have a low density tiger areas, how doles are going to behave in that particular areas. And what will be the effect of the higher versus lower dole populations and their effect on the local prey, prey populations in that particular area? So this is just the beginning of this particular information. And there's a much more which we need to understand about the effect of the dole population on prey species, on the prey composition in, in, in different protected areas across, across our country. And this particular information is just the beginning of that particular, uh, that particular study. So uh, I think uh, now going to the evolutionary context. So we have two different types of the wild dogs in this world. And we know that we have an African wild dog and we have an Asiatic wild dog. And uh, if you see them, when somebody talks about the wild dogs, probably we think they all will be similar. They both will be similar. And there's a huge distinction in these particular species not in terms of uh, where they occur. We know that the Asiatic wild dog occurs in Indian forests and shares its habitat with a large predator. An African wild dog occurs in the different parts of Africa and also shares its habitat with the large predators and occurs also in its, uh, its more savanna type of habitat, whereas our habitat is more sort of closed habitat. And in terms of body shape and body variation, you see the African wild dog is uh, it has a it, it, it has a pattern on its body, whereas an Asiatic wild dog uh, has no pattern. It's it's brown in color, with a with a black tail. And if you see the ears, uh, the ears of the African wild dog is much more round than that of the Asiatic uh, wild dog. And if you now if you if you just think about the the, the, the phylogeny of the all the canids, and if you see that African Asiatic wild dog just evolved of after the African wild dog. And both these species, both these genes are monotypic genes. That means once the African wild dog evolved, the evolution stopped. And once the Asiatic wild dog evolved, the evolution stopped. And the evolution of the Asiatic wild dog from the same clan where the African wild dog has evolved has resulted in the loss of this pattern. So, so the Asiatic wild dog evolved uh, from the same clan but it resulted in the loss of the, 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 the body patterns. So there is, we try to understand what's the relationship between these two particular aspects and, and try to see what are the differences which Asiatic wild dog has gained after evolving a little bit late from that of an African wild dog. So what, what, we, have, what we have seen is that there are, there are very interesting aspects uh, during this evolutionary aspect, which has happened a little bit late for the Asiatic wild dog. So the very interesting is extra pair of carnation teeth. And we all know that what sort of predators uh, the Asiatic wild dog is. So they start eating their prey when they are still alive. So they try to bite the individuals. So in order to have that, they need to have an extra pair of carnation teeth. So they need type of the teeth which is going to bite and take the predator off. They're not having the strong canines, which are going to suffocate the prey and kill the prey, like the tigers and leopards. They are, they are, their skull is not that strong that they are going to kill predator. No, they have to just bite the predator and start eating it. They are, they, they are going to chase the prey, suffocate the prey, and make the prey to 
be as much exhausted as possible and then start eating it. In order to be successful predators, they need to have an extra pair of carnation treats. That's the difference what they had from the Asiatic, from the African wild dogs. And not only that, they have an extra pair of memory glands. And that's why you see that they can really afford large litter sizes. So that's an adaptation to have a large litter sizes. And, and, and in this evolutionary aspect, they have also lost uh, their pledge pattern. So that's the pattern on their skin, and which probably is an adaptation to live in Indian forest. It's probably this is more sort of a camouflage pattern, more, more sort of a pattern to be more successful uh, in Indian forests to have a pattern uh, or, or, or something else. Probably we don't know. The only possible explanation, which probably we, we think is about about is about the habitat type and uh, and these coat pattern genes. So this was um, this was a major evolutionary differences about the evolution of uh, the African wild dogs and the Asiatic wild dogs. And uh, these are some of the videos uh, of the wild dogs. Like this is uh, how the male uh, and the females they both help in uh, rearing the young ones. So this is the video of the, the collared one is the male and the non-collared one is the female. So how both of them help in rearing the young ones. So the parental care is shared by both the individual, both the males and the females. And males have to uh, do more activities because uh, the females, they continue to be on the den, whereas males, they have to go out and get the, get the, get the prey, get the food for the females. And they have a very interesting phenomenon is like the, the males eat the food and then the males will come on the den and they will just regurgitate that food for the females. So I will show there, there will be a one more slide uh, where the females, the male will be regurgitating the food. So here the male is taking the young ones out of the den. So they take these young ones out of the den, keep them uh, in sunshine for some part of the time and then, then, then take them back inside the den. So sort of an hygiene uh, to avoid any parasitic load uh, on these young ones to make their survival more possible. And in this uh, in this landscape where they share their habitat with the tigers and the leopards, these denning areas are very critical. And doors have to be really very intelligent animals to try to find out these areas where they are going to den in an areas where we have a large uh, place like tigers and like doors. So at the end, uh, one of the most uh, one of the most critical predator, one of the one of the least understood predator of Indian jungles, but definitely one of the most in one of the most intelligent predator, one of the most uh, uh, predator which has really which really knows how to survive in the Indian jungles is the dole. And uh, there's a lot of information, but it's just it's, it's just that drop of water in the ocean. There is much to be known about this particular species in Indian jungles. And we really have to come up and think about the very big uh, conservation programs, uh, research programs for rules in different landscapes in our country to understand their ecology in, in much greater detail. I think uh, with this, uh, I, I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. Uh, if you can mute. Uh -huh. So, thank you, Dr. Bilal. It was really an interesting session, and the way you have put all these pictures, the beautiful pictures, uh, in an, such an educative and informative way, is even more intelligent, more intelligent than the doll, it seems. So, as very correctly you said that the least in understood, but the most intelligent predator of the country or the Indian jungles. The door, it really needs much more to be, you know, understood and much more studies to be done on the species. And certainly we are looking forward to work with you on this species, at least in Vizag Zoo. So we are looking forward to it. Thank you very much for this interesting session. Now we move on to uh, Dr. K. Ramesh. So uh, Dr. K. Ramesh is scientist E. Uh, from Wildlife Institute of India from the Division of Landscape Level Planning and Management. Again, I am his student when I was doing my Hari Singh Fellowship in Wildlife Institute of India. So uh, I know his work for a long period of time and he's been associated with uh, WII for a long period of time, almost since 1995. 
I think he started his uh, tenure as a biologist, probably, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, his specialization is in landscape ecology, species and habitat restorations, human pilot conflict resolutions, mechanisms and integration of advanced technologies in wildlife research and management. So he's been working on a lot of projects, especially the recovery, uh, the population recovery and long term monitoring of uh, tigers, which I think everybody in the country who's interested in wildlife must be knowing in Panna Tiger Reserve and other low density reserves of India also he's been working. Also, he has been working on development of integrated uh, landscape management plan in Central India. And I think landscape ecology is uh, one of its uh, his favorite. And uh, he's been talking about it. And now I think uh, it's time that I hand over the mic to him and he talk about it. The Basically, he's going to talk about the in situ and ex situ linkages which is very, very relevant because when we talk about the zoos, we are talking about the conservation breeding of some uh, endangered and rare species or uh, I mean, those are, who are those species which are near to extinction. But we don't really understand the role of zoos in these aspects until it is actually linked to the in situ component. So we need to understand that and we need to work upon that, develop long term strategies and plans so as we can actually do something practical on the ground. Uh, with respect to the linkages between the in situ and ex situ, and that's uh, uh, what something Dr. K. Ramesh is going to talk about uh, with us today. So over to you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you very much for taking this session. Thank you so much, uh, Nandraji, and uh, thank you, um, CFSA. Um, it's a pleasure to actually be part of this uh, session, and uh, I can admit from the beginning that you know I'm no expert on. Uh, the zoo management, but uh, with my little experience of working with uh, conservation breeding and my realization on you know, species recovery strategies, I was, I mean, kind of discussing with Nandini and say, okay, this could be one area where we can discuss. I mean, we could see, I mean, Bilal explaining eloquently about those detail, I think is uh, beautifully set the tone for the session. So I would basically uh, briefly discuss about, you know, how we actually, uh, in fact, how we are placed with respect to this particular species. I think many people probably don't even know that you no know, wolf is one of the very, very you know, rare species now because earlier we used to see them a lot. But although a lot of uh, discussion and you know argument, counter argument saying that because the you know, dole is a wide ranging species, just because you don't see them, it's not that the population declining. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have a concrete data about that. But what we know in general is that the population, even IUCN says, um, the population of uh, oil dog is about 2,500 individuals. I think uh, we can imagine if you are comparing with the tiger and other species. And more importantly, I always believe very strongly that captive populations or zoo, they are not just a, you know, independent uh, population management. They, are, they play really a critical role. And particularly your zoo, I think the Vizag Zoo, I say no, is only zoo probably is holding large number of wild dogs. Obviously, from a national as well as a global context, this zoo management becomes uh, very critical. And this is where I wanted to highlight how the ex situ strategies have relevance to in situ, because as you have seen from uh, Dr. Bilal's uh, presentation, the distribution and the habitat, they all have kind of uh, changed or in terms of the space use and things like that. So if you really needed to kind of look at population management reintroduction, uh, we need to see this uh, very kind of as linked or integrated approach. So I'm going to be, I mean, um, I, have, I have this slide, which uh, It isn't visible. You just stopped presenting. No, no. Actually, I did the same old thing like last time. Is it visible now? Yeah, yeah. It's visible. You can put it on full screen. Yeah, exactly. So, correct. Right. And also Is the visible? height, please. I dial to the target. Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so basically, talking about the institute and exit, you have to be seen. I mean, I know there are different objectives, but I'll highlight that how each of these efforts, investment that we make uh, in zoo management uh, has to be uh, thought through. I mean, I know the lot of uh, professionals currently available uh, 
So particularly with the uh, North Central Zoo Authority providing the leadership and many of the expertise available, um, now I was uh, now kind of thinking that it's probably high time that uh, you know, we actually have a relook at the whole strategy. Because I think, as you know, the captive management of any species is much more um, challenging and it requires a lot more skill than what many people might think. Even when you have a wildly population management, it's one of the famous uh, reserves. But managing a captive population requires uh, multiple skills, uh, talking about the species biology to you know, engineering to you know, the entire life history um, uh, knowledge. So therefore, I mean, if we have those kind of skill set and you know, the mechanism, we can make our captive population you know, more useful rather than just to become exhibits. So if you look at globally, I mean, particularly taking this mammalian reintroduction, Okay, so if anybody is interested in or involved in reintroduction, they would know the lot of reintroduction that has taken place or introduction has taken place all over the world. You can go back to the history as early as 1927, but much of those releases of the reintroduction have come from captive populations. Okay, so I mean, we cannot take captive populations lightly as. Uh, some individuals just being maintained for uh, display purpose or uh, knowing more about them, but they have contributed hugely. But there are lessons there. I mean, while there have been a lot of um, kind of translocation or animal, in fact, even this entire uh, knowledge of the introduction, soft release, and things like that have come from this whole, you know, the captive management to wild. So even with the, so much of successes, and there are also you know, uh, data that suggests that about 50% of the population that's coming from captive has not been as successful as one expected. The reason being, I mean, this is where we need to look at it, why there is so much of opportunity available, but there are also failures, uh, largely to do with the way we probably manage or from the beginning, how we conceive the whole thing. Yeah. So we have to take this as a kind of you know, information in the back of the mind saying that, the captive population not necessarily is going to be the few individuals held in some places, rather they have a huge, huge conservation value across the globe. So as I said, even the captive population in India, they're not in many zoos, about six zoos, I think, with the uh, Vizag Zoo leading the way. But even there, the population size is not very big. So we definitely need to increase the population size along with it, the whole spectrum of the habitat, you no know, kind of trying to optimize uh, the natural behavior of wild law. So if you really wanted to make this population more useful to the conservation. So other thing that we talk about captive population, because we have many cases and starting up a tiger, lion, you know, cheetah, whatever species you pick up. So the large predators are known to uh, basically regenerate the ecosystem. I mean, there's a lot of data that is suggested, like uh, what Bilal was talking about, wild dog has its own niche. So many of us probably don't even know what is happening to those niche, those places where they were lost because their you know, hunting strategies, their habitat use, they're way different from other predators. Therefore, having lost or having the population reduced in some places means that you know, there could be certain impact on the related prey species on the habitat. So therefore, the rewilding, I mean, the rewilding, when we say, obviously, if you have a surplus population in the wild, you can actually translocate from one place to other. But in the absence of such opportunity, then you need to look at captive population. So when the captive population cannot actually be released, therefore we start looking at this term called rewilding. Okay, so rewilding is a process in which you, know, you through a management or the training, you enable these animals to gain or optimize the natural behavior so that when it goes to the wild condition, they are able to behave as the way uh, the wild population behave. I mean, even if not 100%, but at least to the level that it can optimize the life history uh, characters. So there's a lot of discussion and the benefits people have already highlighted that how the large predator have actually regenerated ecosystems. I don't want to go into those details about you know, cascade effects and things like that. But yeah, there are a lot of evidences. So this is one of the evidence that uh, we often talk about how wolf reintroduction has benefited. So, and um, this is a very classic example about this Yellowstone National Park where wolf, you know, elk and vegetation regeneration have been documented. 
and uh, as highlighted as uh, how the predators have actually been important. So this is one quote I wanted to just uh, simply pick up. The predators are so important, the removal has such a long lasting effect that it's naive to think that you can quickly reverse the effect of their absence by restoration. So this is very important. When I said very easily, oh, we just need to look at this captive population or look at reintroduction as one of the major strategy, but we must recognize this aspect that it is not as easy as it may sound because the species relationship, which has evolved over a period of time, is not easy for us to understand. I think it's it's a kind of a big challenge despite so many years of you know, institutions, expertise present. Our knowledge of many of the species are very limited, not about the species knowledge alone. What is limiting is that the relationship part to how these species evolved together, how they structured a system together by limiting a population or by removing population, how this whole system changed. So if, in fact, if you really wanted to bring uh, any species back into a system, it's very important for us to really understand you know, how long it will take and what kind of resource and commitment that is required. So, so this is something we have to keep in mind always when we are trying, because the conservation management, I mean, particularly in the current context, when we are losing population, when you're trying to reintroduce population, it's very expensive uh, uh, proposition. So that is where, although this, when we are talking about first preference of having wild population managed well, but even the captive population, if it is managed very well, uh, having this optimum behavior, then you are in a position to at least start contributing those the restoration process in bits and pieces. But we needed to have long understanding. That is why this larger conservation uh, program, which has a certain understanding of research and management will be a guiding force. So there are many such examples about, you know, um, predators, avian predators, and so a lot, lot of such examples all over is coming up. In fact, there's a very nice uh, article that came, Scientific American. I think one should really have a good hold on. But, uh, but some of those readings actually gives some, what do you call, the highlights for even a ecologist who have been in this field for quite some time. Okay. So this is what I was just telling earlier that you no, know, while it's well accepted that large carnivores play vital ecology role, but just how they shape the ecosystem isn't well understood. So this is true. So we basically making a lot of uh, calculated guesses and some understanding. We basically highlight okay, this is how the species behaving based on our understanding because whatever we do in this wild environment, uh, we don't have so much of knowledge. Whereas, I mean, at least about the species. I mean, there are people who believe very strongly that if you're managing an optimal population captivity, they behave like uh, you know, another small population, you know, where you are able to gain a lot more, which otherwise is very difficult to do it in the wild. So this is where the, the role of zoo, I mean, the ex situ facility comes in. So they're not just basically holding individuals. If you hold individuals as a population, when you say as a population, it is a number, it is a, it's a behavior, it's a habitat, everything together. So they can actually mimic like a small population of any wildlife species, and it allows our scientists and managers a greater understanding of the species. Therefore, if someone who is managing the captive population well with uh, all parameters required for a population to be managed, I think this greater understanding about the species, therefore, even if you have to manage them in the wild, you will be able to relate it. Because at the end of the day, most of the conservation outcomes is measured through reproductive outcomes. The reproductive outcome is a function of the fitness. So if you are able to ensure the fitness again has a relationship with the behavior, the resource uh, availability, competition, exclusion, all sorts of things. But that is where I say that exity facility, I mean, most particularly for such species, needs to be treated as a, a facility for creating a small population. So they remain a kind of reserve, even for common species. I would always believe that. So many of the time people generally discourage that, no, we don't need to really captivate animals. So it really depends on how we do them. I think if you're captivating an animal by limiting its normal behavior, then it is a problem. But if you're able to create a facility which allow them to have a normal behavior, if not 100%, I think we will be doing a great service to the species. Similarly, with the Vizag Zoo, having you know, the leadership for this 
uh, cap conservation breeding of dole if you have, even if you don't have this current facility but uh, using existing facility or expanding the facility if you're able to come up with a kind of the conservation breeding strategies which is from the beginning having the link to ex situ and in situ because we need to have that understanding even if i have a population where i'm going to source the population whether current population that we have is good enough in terms of its uh, demography in terms of its uh, genetic diversity if not we should take a decision and try to bring them and have or maintain a small population which kind of may make the y population and then start having those facilities which allow the species to exhibit natural behavior and breeding. So with that, I mean, you one side, we start gaining the knowledge about the species. I can tell you that I think many of these field biologists can vouch for it. They will tell you that despite having so much of knowledge, spending time, uh, I think this wild dog still see, remains a mysterious species. And uh, even today, I mean, you can look at many, I think many of those experts have been working in Central India, they will tell earlier they used to be large uh, number in Penge Tiger Reserve and Kana. And we also used to have a lot in Panna Tiger Reserve, but we are reduced to one or two packs now. So there are a lot of changes that is taking place. We really don't know what is happening to them. So it, it's probably more than any species, I would say, wild dog requires attention. Maybe other species would be wolf. Um, to have a large population in uh, captivity. So again, for tigers, I mean, um, see, even this, uh, even for such a species like tiger, we had to rely on captive population because despite having wild individuals available, there are requirements or compulsions. So we cannot really underplay uh, the role of captive population for large conservation outcome. So Panna has benefited, but the success we can always debate whether that's been contributing so much or not. But I would always not take this success and failure as a measure of what has happened, but rather go into the process of it. It's like any technology or it's like any program that you do. Suddenly, if something becomes success, failure, it is not about an outcome we need to see. We need to see the entire process. Similarly, if a species or if an individual have been translocated from one place to other or captive population come or if they contributed or not, I think the answer lies in not just an immediate outcome, it's also the process, how we actually evolve. So that is where I want to highlight this particular aspect in Panna. When we had this translocation project, we actually had to source two animals from captivity because that time there was no individual available. Those were sisters brought from a semi-wild. It was purely captive and semi-wild condition, but came and became success. People were very happy about it. But overall, if you look at it, so contribution to this Panna reintroduction program is negligible. Yes, there is a lesson or confidence to say, yes, captive population can come. But what it contributed matters a lot. So that what contributors matters a lot is where we need to pay attention to. If we had prepared, the, because what came to Panna was originally is a rescued animal. It was not meant to be, or it was not trained to be. Of course, I mean, it has kind of contributed, but then if you had planned better, if you exhibited better, probably these animals would also be uh, doing the same way what the other population has done. So therefore, uh, the, my point of highlighting here is that these captive populations have huge role, very unexpectedly sometime, but then how we are preparing them from the beginning is going to be the deciding factor. Otherwise, we will be investing a lot, wasting the money. So to have a captive population which is maintained well from the beginning and uh, with the proper resource and manpower commitment, then I think we are going to be doing great service to them. So tiger reserves have grown and uh, with wild population, but then there's still a uh, recommendation coming from NDC saying that in places with low densities, we should look at and you know, kind of controlled population, things like that. Yeah. So as I said earlier, wolf and wild dog will be a key species, but particularly in this particular case where Isaac Zoo is leading, I think, yes, uh, we need to really plan whatever at our disposal to have important, excellent uh, you know, conservation breeding population. So the guideline that I use and always proposes is, I think, is a beautiful uh, um, the process to look at whatever we do. I think if anybody goes through these steps, I would say that you know they wouldn't make so much mistakes, but sometimes we tend to uh, get carried away by our local expertise and uh, you know our own confidence. But uh, in each of the steps, if you go through, I mean, what exactly we really want to do? Suppose 
it, this particular thing is meant for you know, conservation situation assessment. It is, it's a kind of situation analysis and your decision making process. So if a situation analysis warrants that you want to simply maintain a small population or just collate the population or you want to just keep the population as a you know, model population, reserve population, then you need to decide where are we now? Do we have enough captive population? Suppose instead of having a, several individual distributed in multiple zoos, can we have at least coordinated effort to have one facility? We start with it or start looking at current status source in animals and then so those are the things that we need to decide so goal obviously will decide what exactly we are doing even with the captive population so if an exit facility is created or having a wild dog then we need to know what exactly we are going to do with them because we, we have all the examples in the past with the you know, and things like that when we had a captive population i mean with uh, some idea but then when the population became too many we really don't know what to do with them but sometimes you have the population, but they are still rare animals, but they're highly inbred and they are not behaviorally oriented. So you still just maintain, they become a liability or showcase material. Therefore, the goal must be decided at the very beginning. Therefore, our action is oriented. Once we have this goal, then again, again you look at the alternatives. Definitely, do we really need to have this population in Vizag Zoo or elsewhere? Or do we have any alternative? If you don't have an alternative or if you can create an option, then we should decide, okay, this is what I want to do. Then look at what are the feasibilities. Like I think the initial note, uh, the safes have mentioned, resource is a very big problem. But even if you have, I mean, last time I remember there's a discussion with the Central Authority that the public-private partnership, even if you can bring some of the species under the public-private partnership, maybe have, we need to really go with the proper DPR and approach uh, you know the private player and say okay this is a conservation species maybe attached to your form so we will they will should probably adapt them and and then adopt them so that for a long time so you have those kind of options so once that feasibility of having this population grow is in ensured then we should do the next step so then look at the risk what potential risk happens from the scientific management resource point of view then we need to decide. So this is the framework that was made for translocation. I would say this is applicable to all sorts of management. Then once we have the decision made as to what we want to do, then we need to look at design. And then design also has a both feasibility and risk component. And then look at specific objectives and action. Then start implementing. While implementing, the monitoring has to be that When I say monitoring, it is not just about population monitoring. I wanted to highlight again, I know people who are working in the zoo, probably listening. When we talk about monitoring, I think monitoring of indicator has to be at all level. It needs to be at the enclosure level, it needs to be at the behavior level, it needs to be at the, all steps of the life history parameters of these animals, whichever is animals, bird, doesn't matter. So once you start monitoring indicator, I think that's much easier to pick it up rather than just waiting for its overall reproductive outcome, then by the time you invest so much, no, you are not able to intervene. So these kind of things have to be looked at. The finally, you look at the overall outcome. Then the outcome obviously will get into two sides. One, you will disseminate, and then it, if it is the best practices, we should start upscaling it. Or if there are lessons to be learned, learn, then you have it brought it back as a feedback into this uh, adaptive management risk and overall conservation situation. This is something that I would say uh, provide a clear framework for the ex situ and in situ uh, linkages because we are in a country with uh, limited resources and uh, capacity. But all the investors that we make has to have a clear linkages. And uh, I mean, it's more like gaining more benefits than just one target because all of our zoos with uh, good leadership, it's currently, I can see many of these young officers uh, you know, in, in charge of zoo with a lot of expertise. So I think with the more uh, holistic program uh, will really help us uh, move forward. So as I said, this linkage is essentially uh, comes here. So you basically maintain as a reserve for preventing space extension. I mean, even if you look at earlier on people, that is what we say, okay, we are actually doing this captive population conservation bidding for these purposes. But we need to really make sure, yes, this is what, and then obviously zoos also on exhibits. So even in an exhibit, I would say, I mean, even for visitors, even a children, anybody who's coming to a zoo, they need to gain a reliable knowledge about the species. 
if wild dog is a docile is not exhibiting its natural behavior i think it's not even serving the purpose therefore whatever the exhibit that we have it needed to be aligned to natural environment therefore i mean because this is more for a knowledge even you know gaining expertise many of us don't even know what exactly is happening so if you are able to provide that mechanism so i think others who are visitors will gain better knowledge and then they continue to become when you have this captive population as a you know as a source for reintroduction reinforcement i think even a population management we are talking about okay so you need to have those population suitable for these purposes and there are interventions where we do and this was an example that we we try to always uh, look at a conservation breeding as a whole i mean all these three components will come in play habitat feeding and behavior okay so obviously the size definitely needs to be looked at uh, what kind of size because we talking about home range of the species but then home range of species cannot be provided in the captive population then what will be the next best op option so we need to really see what may be the optimal daily movement rate for some yeah it's some it's very difficult to put across this is where the knowledge from wild also comes so we need to gain those information as to how far these animals go where they spend do they get restricted in some season do they move around or what is the activity area so based on which we need to decide this enclosure and then you provide this enrichment based on what kind of habitat they feel more comfortable which means less stressed so a you see clear relationship coming from in situ to ex situ here so we cannot keep these two things apart if you really wanted to make a population uh, really good and then the visual effect sometime you need a barrier sometime you need to create the communication the animal needs to see so all those options have to be thought through on feeding feeding is another important so i think before getting the feeding i will look at uh, this the enclosure design i think this is very classic example we often use it uh, even conservation breeding or presence and things like that so how do you actually i mean when you say conservation breeding I and mean, sometimes you have a tendency that we try to keep uh, people away from seeing it but to me i think it's probably not necessary if you really plan well and people why not people see some of this activity provided we manage them in a way that it is less obstruction to the species so if a design parameters taken into account which allow a species to can feel a sense of security i mean the one that is elongated uh, design is probably the best one where animal can still be there in the enclosure without being hugely disturbed by human so this design parameters also but sometimes you use a technology i mean you can actually bring the technology and then have a video wall or some kind of display where people can see what's happening live so it this actually motivates encourages people and then you would also start generating resources for conservation breeding product so feeding again diet composition like we have mentioned about the diet and you uh, know what kind of diet we need to look at and is the slaughtered sometime live these kind of things we need to see and uh, what situation whether we need to follow a fixed model which we do in a zoo probably not we, we, we if you are trying to maintain a captive population i think this regime you know the husbandry regime which is more of a what do you call captive stocks meant for you no know, more controlled uh, support system or whatever the resource that we want to extract with the livestock it should not be there i think it needs to be provided to as naturally as food availability will be available to them so that way again you need a knowledge from the wild so exit knowledge will feed into how you actually make this diet composition and the way you present the diet so again breeding so for the the wild dog you need the display then you need to dis they have it inside and they need to be multiple options they need to be multiple location which means that if and you are cap keeping them in in a large facility then you can provide them if you don't have a large facility obviously you are going to be constrained therefore if you are planning a conservation breeding program for wild dog i think we need to have these things in mind and plan a strategy therefore whatever investment we do suppose even the government of india is providing the fund or if it is not available if you want to go to the private partners they can have this holistic plan and then have a direction okay if, if the population is going to grow this level then which, which is my immediate soft release strategy where i am going to have them so that way even the people who are involved in zoo management or not just necessarily this uh, leadership who might change but those people who are continuously working 
I think this involvement and the passion will get automatically increased by the thought that, okay, what they're doing is not just a routine mechanical work, but then there's, these are the larger per conservation purpose. They're actually contributing to the species as well as to the nature and to the larger society. So at the end, this is what I want to look at how this integrated uh, approach should be. So looking at the exity population, obviously exity population is where you are now trying to maintain this exity population should have optimization of habitat, optimized the habitat. You need to have them habitat that is optimized and similarly diet and behavior. And then you also need to look at the suitability of the captive stock. What kind of captive stock into currently what we have them. And based on these options and uh, current population that we have, or if you need be, we need to source individual from the wild if need be. I think, as I said earlier, looking at those decision-making, uh, the process in IUCN guideline, each step we need to ask this question and take decision. See, I can always tell you, experts' opinions come with their experiences, but it's not necessary all the time is going to be the right thing. But then this opinions and those knowledge that is available has to be put through this scrutiny of this decision-making process, which is objective and which can be verified by people. Then when you take this decision, when you put these resources, it can be very helpful. So ultimately, then we can support this institute conservation of the species. So overall, I mean, uh, looking at this whole uh, strategy, I mean, uh, in, in captive population management and conservation breeding, I would say, I mean, if we have this integrated approach, both from the knowledge, I mean, it's not when you say integrated approach, we are not simply talking about physically from institute to institute, it comes from the multiple aspects, the knowledge, the understanding, and similarly creating the space here, and then looking at the conservation situation in the wild. So I think it's it's back and forth all the time. It's not just once. You just brought the animal from there, then leave it here and just keep leave it to the mercy of people. I think the close coordination, if, if there is a conservation breeding program, like currently we are just signing MOU with uh, the lead to and coordinated to. I would also prefer that if we can have a signature MOU signed with one of the the cap you no know, with the wild population reserve manager or the unit. So therefore they can continue to work together and then contribute and make this conservation breeding program more successful. I would personally uh, wish, I think Vaisak Zoo uh, has its potential and has the responsibility to take the lead and uh, with the sourcing more individuals and managing a good composition, this can be successful. So i like to wish everyone and thank you so much for uh, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramesh. I mean, it was a very interesting session while you have very interestingly uh, merged the two things like the XC2 and the NC2 approach and the conservation strategies. How do we go about it? I'm happy to say that we are thinking on those lines. Given the resource crunch, we are not really able to execute things, but certainly we are on the same uh, approach. As you very well pointed out, the IUCN guidelines for the various, uh, I mean, uh, the conservation guidelines. So we are thinking on those lines and I'm happy uh, to feel, I mean, and to experience that, okay, we are somewhere confirming to those guidelines, but yeah, we have to, we have still a long way to go. Thank you for this beautiful session. It is certainly a guideline for us as well. I mean, a refresher course kind of thing for us to work upon our conservation breeding project. And certainly we are looking forward to take more guidance from your end. So now, since we are through with our expert talk uh, in this session, and uh, in the end, I would just like to give a brief uh, outline of how the conservation breeding of wild dog, uh, Asiatic wild dog or dhol is going about in Vizag Zoo. So I would just like to put on my presentation. Um, so is my presentation visible? by any chance no i don't think so is it okay right thank you so yeah uh, so as curator of igzp i would like to give you a brief outline of how the conservation breeding of asiatic wild dog is going on so i would just i would not go into the details i would just give a brief outline of how it started actually if i have to say uh, igzp is one of the foremost zoos in the country which has been regularly breeding dolls in captivity and we have proudly given a lot of uh, animals to other zoos also where they are also breeding well through animal exchange. 
so they are also breeding well and uh, i mean other zoos also of india so we have been i mean somewhere helpful in creating a captive population of this species in the indian zoos so uh, given this uh, cza has also recognized igzp as a coordinating zoo for the conservation breeding of the doles and they have been financing us uh, here and there with uh, some funding support for taking up this project uh the present stock of wild dogs in our zoo is around 29 to 10 that total comes around 39 uh, animals and uh, we have these animals like 25 animals are in the conservation breeding center and rest of them are in two different enclosures which are open to public while the wild dog uh, breeding center is it is it is an off display facility which is the only facility in the country so that certainly has the potential of raising a population which could be a uh, potential population for uh, releasing into the re, uh, for uh, i mean reintroduction into the wild so currently in the zoo in the wild dog breeding center we have uh, four established packs from three different lineages and we are also uh, making efforts uh, to bring some non related and in individuals from tirupati zoo that's the immediate plan because we have some uh, wild uh, rescued animals there in tirupati zoo so that would be something which we are working on right now and uh, once we get these animals we would be uh, breeding these animals with the existing ones so as we have some genetic hybridization in the existing genetic pool so yeah that's about it and how it started is uh, as uh, conservator sir had already apprised that it started with actually one male and two females and a pair of pups it was just a mere accident we can say serendipity where uh, they had fallen into the open moat of isaac zoo enclosure in 1992 and while two male cubs died in that and three were left in 1994 again the same episode happened where one male and one female again uh, fell into the moat and we had in total five animals uh, which actually started breeding uh, here we housed them and we provided all the uh, captive facilities to them and then uh, the breeding this is how it started so if you see the year wise statistical data so here when the real intervention started from 2007 to 2008 and so the population has started increasing so now if you see around 2018 19 the population started decreasing because uh, the breeding we have reduced because uh, we need some uh, uh, new genes into the uh, existing gene pool so we have we are limiting the, the breeding to the to some animals only because we want some genetic hybridization in the existing gene pool for which we are working upon Uh, given this corona pandemic we could not uh, undertake the exchange pro programs uh, which was underlined already so hopefully things come through soon and we are able to resume back every activity so as i said earlier like central zoo authority had selected igzp for creation of an exclusive off display conservation breeding center so since this off display conservation breeding center which is actually on a hill up and is surrounded by hillocks and thus a uh, zoo is this zoo is, is the first zoo in india to have this facility exclusively for uh, dhol so this is how it looks like so here if you see this concrete structure is the night houses and you also have a holding crawl on the right end of it where we keep the newborn pups with the mother until and these are the day crawls on the front side of this thing where they also have a shade uh, space in the day crawl in case it is too sunny and everything and we have also provided them water holes and dens in this so you, you see uh, as you see around there is all vegetation around and uh, we don't have any uh, human activity around this area so it's a total off display there is no human access except the keeper and the security guard who stays here and we also have plans of expanding because as on this place i mean there is some kind of uh, human access like the keeper there the animals are able to see the keeper the keeper is having interaction with the animals so something which we want to uh, avoid in the future so as uh, these animals are fit to be released into the into the wild in future in the coming years so we want to extend extend certainly this facility to uh, the front area where the day crawl could be a bigger one the open open type of and also we need to increase the night houses also so this is something which we are planning in the future and we have also submitted a five year action plan to uh, uh, cza uh, we are also trying to rope in some corporates like ntpc uh, they have shown some interest in the sponsoring the conservation breeding of this uh, uh, species so we are looking forward for a positive response from them to whom we have already submitted the proposal 
so this is about it i mean the animals are really uh, housed in a big enclosure where they have adequate landscape land space for facilitating the animals to have free movement and exercise and adequate area to rest uh, in shade as well as in sun they also have i mean you if you see the the area is quite big the dacre also they ha do have a safe refuge from dominant animals if any in the pack and uh, they can very well express their natural social and uh, reproductive behavior because they've also given them dens and the breeding behavior also is exhibited quite uh, uh, naturally in these uh, so this is how it looks like we have recently so uh, done some renovations from the funding by cza day so that's how it looks now earlier it was quite damaged so these are the dens here and the water holes and uh, this is how i mean these are all details about the feeding so as uh, dr ramesh pointed out that the feed should be as natural as possible is something which we need to work upon in the future and we are looking forward to do something about it uh, also the reproductive behavior we are provide i mean this is something the denning behavior is something very unique and i mean not unique as such but yeah the way they uh, the dr bilal also has shown the male and female both uh, showing the parental behavior is exhibited here also and it's very interesting to see when uh, the newborns are uh, new, uh, the new, new pups are born and the way female doe comes out of the den occasionally to check for predators and for feeding so it's very interesting and the keeper is really has become a pro in managing these dens and taking care of the animals while uh, uh, they are lactating or the animal is pregnant so uh, i think uh, these are some of the factors like we take care while we ensure that there is successful breeding initially for a long period of time uh, here the management was doing marking of the individuals with permanent non toxic dyes but it did not work much so uh, i mean other techniques were also used uh, generally keeper has a knowledge and uh, keep the keeper compatible uh, compatible male and a female together prior to the breeding season itself and then no other person would be allowed uh, inside or near to the enclosure except the keeper and in fact near the whelping then also the keeper would also minimize his uh, uh, i mean the uh, movement so the during the pregnancy to support it the female side will generally be supplemented and there is a close observation daily observations by the keeper by the biologist and the veterinary team uh, to ensure that there is successful breeding as well as once the breeding has happened how we are supplementing the animals is also being looked after very carefully so cctv cameras are also installed and any health concern are immediately brought to the attention of the zoo veterinarian we also carry out lot of uh, disinfections on a regular basis like every 3 months if you see this pictures we are doing the top layer of soil is being removed and mixed with bleaching powder so as there is no infection uh, to avoid the infection to the animals from the fecal matter or anything else and also the line washing and the flame torching vaccination and deworming is of course something very very regular practice the treatments also we are, we are developing the infrastructure every day uh, to ensure that the proper treatment is given so research initiatives i think uh, while uh, wise zoo has been doing a great job uh, in the conservation breeding of the species and has uh, maintained a good population of the species but uh, with respect to research we had some uh, initiatives here and there but i think a, a long term plan needs to be developed in terms of research and for that actually we don't we have a common biologist here in the zoo who looks after all the animals other than dolls as well so we need a biologist who can be uh, i mean dedicated towards this species towards the project only which we are certainly looking forward to and working upon and see those enrichment activity in the enclosures if you see here the arrow shows that we hang the meat like this that people will hang the meat like this and uh, they will have some activity some entertainment for them to exhibit their natural behavior so uh, as i was saying that uh, for exchange value i mean uh, we have exchanged uh, uh, not as such value but yeah of course asiatic wild dogs we have been able to spare many uh, animals to other zoos like pilukula zoo like mysore zoo sakarbag zoo and alipur zoo where these animals have bred very well and we are proudly saying that okay uh, we have been able to help in maintaining a captive population of the species in other indian zoos also so it's again a great effort i think in uh, terms of conservation breeding of the species while the species is endangered in the wild 
so all in all i think we are doing uh, we are providing a high standard of daily care and other facilities uh, but we still uh, i mean when it comes to uh, linkages of ex to an in situ certainly we still have a long way to go and we need to work upon the enclosures and the various other activities connected to it uh, also we are trying to rope in the corporates as i mentioned earlier in financing the conservation breeding project of uh, the species and we are also looking forward to contribute more by doing research studies on the behavior ecology of the species and uh, we have already submitted a five year action plan to cza um, uh, for the which includes uh, certainly the reintroduction and monitoring plan and strategy of uh, the species in the wild which will of course include the soft release and the hard release part in identifying of the sort uh, the soft release sites and then monitoring them and then further into the hard release that's how it will go so that's a brief about it i think uh, in the coming days we would be dealing in uh, detail about it so that's from my side uh, any questions i would be happy to answer so that's uh, about it so since we have ended this uh, i mean we are over with all the sessions i would just i would just see the live chat in the youtube uh, streaming and there are few questions uh, the first question is to dr bilal habib where mr raja shekhar bandi has asked that um, is there any specific conservation strategy for dholes in forest with no tigers and leopards uh, like he means that right. he means that or maybe a low prey base in your low prey base as of uh, yeah as of now there is uh, no special strategy for anywhere not even in the areas where there are uh, more tigers or even more leopards so as of now uh, we know that we have a very interesting project going on in country which is uh, a tiger conservation so everything is under uh, going under that umbrella project so whether it's a conservation of the dolls it's conservation of the leopards so i think these tiger reserves have emerged as one of the leading uh, project tiger has emerged as one of the leading conservation story which is helping dolls but there is nothing more specific as of now thank you dr bilal uh, thank you for the answer uh, then another question for dr ramesh uh, the question is what are the important points to be followed to preserve endangered species and general type of question i don't know how but how that's general that, i think that's a general uh, question i think is a lot that uh, we need to talk about from the i think most critical i would say about the habitat i think if we can if we can manage the habitat i think we can manage the rest i would say it shortly very smartly any any inputs uh, from dr bilal on this question you also stand on the same line stand on the same line i think yeah it's uh, if you have better habitat better forests i think we have everything is better so that's the bottom line of most of the wildlife so very rightly said from both the experts from wildlife institute of india so uh, i think at the end of the day we need to conserve our forest to save any species whether it is human beings or whether it is any wild animal so with that i think we close this session and i would like to formally give a vote of thanks uh, firstly i would thank central zoo of authority dr sp adav sir the member secretary central zoo authority and um, uh, dr sonali ghosh ma'am uh dig forest from cza and the entire team uh, led by sir and ma'am who have been very instrumental in doing this 75 weeks program of bharat ka amrit mahotsav uh, i mean it's a really great uh, outreach activity which has which at least so far in my career i have not seen uh, so it's a great activity and certainly uh, i mean we also feel uh, good and privileged to participate and organize such events where we actually are focusing on species which are least uh, understood as dhol today because you generally talk about tigers and leopards dhol hardly anybody talks until people like uh, dr bilal working on them you know so that's how it is so thank you cza day for taking up this entire program of bharat ka mahotsav amrit mahotsav and i thank uh, andhra pradesh forest department pccf hof sir shri n pratik kumar ifs for giving uh, me this opportunity to uh, host this program 
the CCF Wildlife uh, of Andhra Pradesh, Sri Rahul Pandey, sir, for his support and encouragement. The Conservative Forest, Vishakhapatam, Sri P. Ram Mohan, sir, who has been there as a support and encouraging us to take up all the activities with much enthusiasm and motivation. And all the senior officers uh, and colleagues from Andhra Pradesh Forest Department. I would also thank, uh, special thanks to uh, Wildlife Institute of India, the director, sir. Dr. Bilal Habib and Dr. K. Ramesh, who has spared their time. I mean, in this pandemic times, where you are doing so many webinars, they have also spared some more time for us also and taken up this session. And thank you very, very much for such interesting sessions and uh, participating uh, in this program. We are actually looking forward uh, to working on this project with uh, both of you and your teams. And uh, certainly, we'll be working on some proposal very soon, I'm sure about it. Um, so uh, next is uh, uh, my team at uh, IGZP Vishakhapatnam, my assistant curators, forest section officers, the conservation education team who has been through, uh, who has been working through this, uh, create, I mean, organizing the entire event, the education officer, Ms. Divya, PRO Ramna, conservation biologist uh, Purushottam, doctor, the veterinary doctors, and butterfly park assistant. Everybody has been very enthusiastically working towards this uh, event, the Stardust Ventures, the organizer of this webinar, the press and news media for uh, publicizing this event and so that we have a uh, good participation throughout the week. The participants who and the viewers who have watched us today online will, and who will be participating in the coming days. So thank you very much, one and all. Uh, we, are, we feel privileged to host this event of week-long celebrations for the wild dog, Asiatic wild dog. And uh, we would be happy to have any kind of special requests also, if any, from the kids or school sites, if there are any. And uh, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Dr. Bilal. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Vimal, you can close, I think.